thanks for the moving introduction. It's all the more moving that I'm very happy to hear you saying that I'm young. You said it twice, I got. <laughs> and, um, and it's also moving because uh, it's been almost 12 years I visited CQT for the first time. Uh, and uh, so CQT was not very, very old at the time. And uh, I, I loved the place immediately. And uh, I'm extremely happy today to give my first talk with the CQT logo on the right and with the Majulab logo on the left. Uh, well, that's and I'm all the more happy to give it here uh, in the CQT uh, Quantum Cafe. So uh, as you can notice from this first slide, the, the title of the presentation has changed a little bit. It's no more quantum technologies need a quantum energy initiative. It's simply the Quantum Energy Initiative presentation because we actually founded it. And I'm going to explain you what it's all about and uh, why we need fresh blood. <laughs> So that's going to be like a, a gigantic advertisement talk. And um, that's going to be a little bit unusual talk. So be prepared to that. In this presentation, there will certainly be more questions than answers. There will be a few uh, scientific results that I have obtained uh, thanks to Wekun, who maybe is in the room, but I, there is a collaboration with, with Wekun that is actively going at CQT. But most of the talk will be for me to try to give you perspective and to give you feel like uh, coming and work with us. So that's, that's the program. Okay, so uh, yeah, the outline is very simple. Uh, first, I will present the context uh, of uh, what gave us the idea of creating this initiative and why it was needed and why it's still, what are our motivations. Then I will present you a proof of concept, which is typically the results we get with Wekun and the research line we have started to create, which is basically all about estimating the energy cost of a full stack quantum computer on an ideal device. And uh, just to show you that the methodology works, but there are still holes every everywhere that we need people to feel. And then I will come to the conclusions and outlook. So first of all, uh, a bit of philosophy, also to bounce back on what you said, Christian, about uh, the fact that we like philosophy here. Um, this is a very schematic view on, on human activities. When you do science, when you rather do technology, you build machines uh, so that the machine uh, develops some activity instead of you. Okay, so you have a slave machine. And uh, this machine, uh, you have to feed it with matter, with energy, so typically with physical resources. And in return, the machine, if you built it properly enough, it's going to implement the task that you ask her to do, or her, well, her to do, uh, with a certain uh, metric of performance that quantifies the quality of the result you obtain. Okay, and with very like, highly systemic view on a machine, you can already define an efficiency. Yeah, the, the microphone is not that good. You can hear me still or, yeah. Um, you can define an efficiency. An efficiency, it's nothing but your performance divided by the resource cost, what you paid to, to achieve uh, this performance. And so, at the beginning, when I entered the field of thermodynamics and also the field of technology, in my naive view, I was telling myself, well, it's good. Uh, my goal is to increase efficiency. Whatever efficiency it is, uh, that's my purpose in life. Then uh, you attend a few conferences when you hear about the, the rebound effect or also called the Jevons paradox. And this uh, rebound effect is telling you that uh, basically, if you have a machine that you increase the efficiency of, then it doesn't necessarily lead to. J'ai un problème avec le micro, non? Yeah. Um, anyway, you, you still hear me properly? Yeah. Okay. Well, but this one is not. Uh, well, it's. Uh, I always have problems with microphones anyway. Um, so, uh, if you increase the efficiency of a machine, actually, the problem that you may have is that uh, you're going to increase the global consumption. And uh, this can lead, actually, to uh, the opposite of what you wanted, which is basically that if you increase the efficiency, you can also reach the same performance with, the, with less resource. Okay? And to me, this appears as a reasonable paradigm in a world that has finite resources. So, while the Jevon paradox, actually, it's just, 
it's just the result of something which is not physical. And the explanation of this paradox is the following. If you increase the efficiency, you uh, decrease the price of the product you are fabricating. If you decrease the price, you augment the demand. If you increase the demand, you increase the consumption. But this is not physics. This is economy. This is not objective. So as far as I'm concerned, and in the rest of the talk, what I'm going to do, and that will be my red wire, is to develop machine whose I'm going to try to increase the efficiency. OK? So then the efficiency is actually something that people have considered for long uh, in classical computing. If you uh, consider a classical computer, the efficiency it's usually defined, again, as the performance divided by the resource cost. And for classical computers, the performance that people have in mind, it's the number of operations that you are able to execute per second. So it's the computing power. And it's measured by flops, right? And this is really, um, as we say in French, le monde d'avant. We try to compute fast, to have more, I mean, to be able to watch more series, Netflix, or whatever. But th that's the, the, the mindset, OK? You, you see my point. And then what is the resource? Well, the resource is the power consumption. So if I divide uh, the computing power by the power consumption, I get a performance per watt, which is measured by flops per watt, which has the dimension of an energy. And this is uh, how people uh, basically measure the uh, efficiency of supercomputers. This is based on this figure of merit that we can, uh, for instance, rank the most energy efficient supercomputers, which is called the uh, green 500. And what we uh, have observed over years is that the computing, the computing efficiency, since the first computers were, were created, it has doubled every 18 months. So this is known as Kumi's law, which is actually the counterpart of Moore's law, basically. And this is a tremendous progress uh, regarding uh, classical computation, with currently the, the, the best-in-class supercomputers, they reach uh, 52 gigaflops per watt. That's uh, the, the, the best one, uh, the, the record of, of this year. And uh, well, the only problem is that this Kumi's law, it's actually currently saturating. Just like Moore's law, we cannot increase the efficiency of classical computer anymore. And uh, there is another problem, which has to see with the ribbon paradox again. You give people computers that compute super fast, they will want more computer, they will want more computer, and then the uh, global uh, consumption because of information communication technology has just exploded. Now it's over 10 percent, uh, only in 2020. And OK, and, and actually, like I was saying, because of the saturation of Kumi's law, there is no reason why this should improve. So there is no hope we can expect from a, a improvement of efficiency in this realm. So this actually brings people to become eager for a paradigm shift. And the paradigm shift regarding information processing, where well, you are well positioned to know that uh, we have hopes for quantum technologies, OK, to get us out of this, uh, of this conundrum. So uh, what is the promise of quantum technologies? It is basically captured by this, uh, by this very simple figure here, where uh, what you see is the computing time, which can be seen as the performance, OK? And, uh, the, the, and here you have the problem size. This is what happens with classical computing for some problems with, the, with the, the, the size of some problem that increases. Then the computing time for uh, classical computers explodes, while for quantum computer, you can hope that the computing time remains like in check, OK? So uh, that's usually what people call the quantum supremacy, uh, when a quantum computer can do what no classical computer would do in a reasonable time, while the quantum computational advantage is when a quantum computer can compute simply faster than a classical computer, OK? So this is all well known. This is the promise of quantum computing. But now, uh, what people get aware for uh, get aware of while trying to 
really build quantum computers. So going from Isaac and Chiang to the real lab where you really build the quantum computer, is that uh, all these promises here, they are valid for noiseless quantum computing. But the fact is that uh, your processors, they are noisy. And if they are noisy, you need to do operations, extra operations. You need to correct errors. This basically increases the number of physical operations you have to do. Then it increases the time. And then, basically, you are not really sure anymore Then your computing time with a quantum computer will be much lower than the computing time with a classical algorithm. Okay, And also, classical guys, they are not that stupid. They have ways to optimize the algorithms, which lowers the computing time with classical processors. So basically, one of the biggest challenges of the quantum computing community these days is to see is actually all these nice concepts and promises of quantum computing, quantum advantage, quantum supremacy, etc. They are resilient when we start putting noise in the game. Moreover, with actually this uh, plot, you see as well that there are uh, actually new regimes for quantum computation. There is the fault-tolerant large-scale quantum computing, where all the promises have been done, like I'm going to uh, do Shor's algorithm and, and break RSA with large size keys and whatever. But there are also other regimes, like just fault-tolerant quantum computing with a, a, little, a few logical qubits, or even noisy quantum computing with the NISC era. And all these regimes, they need to find use cases, which is the other big challenge of the quantum computing community. OK? So now, which probably you know, um, I want to bring the debate actually on something which is slightly different, which is what about energy? What happens to these plots if, instead of considering the computing time, I now consider the energy consumption? And then, well, actually, what I'm going to be interested in now will be the efficiency, which is the problem size, divided by the energy I need to execute or to, to solve this problem. And then, actually, I can define precisely the same uh, concepts, like the quantum energy supremacy, which would be the regime where a computer, a quantum computer, can solve a problem which uh, no classical computer could solve with a reasonable energy, and the quantum energy advantage, or simply when quantum computing just consumes less. Okay? So, well, and the question is actually exactly the same. The, do these regimes exist? Can I bring them into reality by uh, fabricating real devices? So, um, actually, the community is absolutely, absolutely uh, not mature to answer these questions. If actually I was doing a poll right now, well, by the way, I can do it. So how many of you think that uh, if I try to do a large-scale quantum computer, I will explode the energetic consumption and I will need three nuclear plants? You are actually believers. How many of you think that there will be a quantum energy advantage? <laughs> oh, you are not believers. You are agnostic, actually. <laughs> OK, I don't count on the agnostic option, but yeah. The, the fact is that, so now if you pick the archive, there are not that many papers. But in the papers that you can see, half of them will say, oh, you are going to explode everything. Stop the quantum computing stuff. Or uh, you find other paper where they investigate the quantum energy advantage. And so looking at this, actually, um, there is a simple diagnostic for this. It's that, first of all, there is clearly a research line that needs to be created. Because right now, there is no methodology. And so we need to uh, show people how they can work together to address this kind of question. And second, we also need to convince people who fund quantum technologies that uh, it's not very like smart to wait we have built the quantum computer before looking at its energy consumption. Okay? Because that's one of the problems of artificial intelligence, by the way. Uh, you start building and then, oh, well, it, it heats up. <laughs> What's happening? Okay? So, uh, 
that's our point. We need a quantum energy initiative, and actually all the arguments that I'm giving you now, they are developed on a few pages in this, uh, in this white paper that was published in June. So now, what is actually the big scientific challenge, uh, which is, uh, there are political ones, but here I'm going to talk about science. The big problem is that it's an interdisciplinary challenge. We need to connect people who, for now, don't really talk to each other. And why am I saying this? It's precisely because of the concept of efficiency I was defining at the beginning. Efficiency, as I was saying, it's a performance divided by a resource cost. And in a quantum computer, the performance, it's actually something that emerges at the quantum level. Why is that so? It's because your quantum processor here it is usually noisy, and you are trying to control it. And the performance that you are going to have, it's the result of this fight of control against noise. But this is something that really happens at the quantum level. Okay? And your quantum processor, it's described as a quantum open system. Right? So and, and, and it's, very, it's very simple. You control. Well, then there is a good metric of performance. You control bad, noise wins, and you have a bad metric of performance. So already at this level, uh, there are various approaches that you can think about to try to mitigate noise. There is error correction, obviously. There is environment engineering. There is simply the speed at which you are going to try to do your computation. Also, there is the little guys of the hardware that are trying to fabricate good qubits with not too much decoherence, you see? So there is already a cluster of expertise that is needed at this level, which not necessarily talk to each other. But then you can also think in terms of already at this level, there is some resource consumption. Because to engineer environment or to fabricate good qubits, I need resources, OK? And so actually, already at this level, I can define an efficiency as the performance divided by the resource cost. And already at this level, what I'm going uh, to have to do is to uh, connect people that know how to manage the resource cost and that know how to optimize the resource cost to reach a given performance. And these guys, they are also known. They are the people of quantum control. They are the people of quantum thermodynamics of quantum information science in general, so quantum software, hardware, and you are going to find nice keywords like fundamental bounds, quantum speed limits, hardware efficiency. It's all connected to the same idea or the same motivation, which is to minimize the resource cost to reach a well-defined performance. Okay? So the mindset, it's already existing, but it has to be like consolidated, say. And now, the second step is that this does not exist per se. Okay? Uh, quantum processor with a little bit of noise uh, with a computation, it does not exist like this. You need to pay a lot. And what you have to do is to put the quantum processor in a box and to actually dig a pouch of quantum instead of inside the classical world. In other words, you need to create a quantum classical boundary, which in quantum thermo, we say it's a highly non-equilibrium situation because the, the processor here, what he wants is to become classical. That's what he wants to do. So you need to prevent it from becoming classical. And it costs a lot. Okay? And actually, you can phrase it in fundamental terms. like It's basically the cost of locking a Schrodinger cat state. Okay? Put it in a box. And uh, actually, this kind of question, as far as I know, from the fundamental point of view, was never really explored because it needs to have a conception of quantum mechanics where you not only have the classic, the, the, the quantum Schrodinger equation, you also need the classical context as well. So I think that's a very interesting fundamental question to explore. But coming back to our like more pragmatic point of view, um, to isolate your quantum processor, once your quantum processor is isolated, there is something more you need to do. You need to control it from the external world. Okay? 
you need to bring like uh, the microwave that are going to drive your qubits. You need to cool it down. You need to do stuff to your processor from the external world. And this actually mandates the use of macro resources. Basically, it's all the classical macroscopic degrees of freedom that you are going to need to control your processor. And this depends on the qubit technology. If you are playing with cold qubits, you will need cryogeny. You will need the wires that go and talk to your uh, processor. You will need, obviously, control electronics. You will need lasers if you are doing like photonic quantum computer. You will need, obviously, single photon detectors, etc. All these guys, they are the biggest resource cost because they are macroscopic, per se, okay? And so, if I come back now to my efficiency here, you can understand that it is a hybrid figure of merit, because at the numerator, you have a performance, which, as I was saying, it's at the quantum level that everything gets decided, and at the denominator, you do have the resource, which here is a parameter that comes from the classical world. And that's the reason why you need to articulate different levels of description to be able to do nice optimizations because as soon as you start to optimize, then you need to coordinate the different inputs. And that's precisely what the Quantum Energy Initiative uh, has the ambition to create. It's a cross-disciplinary research line that can put together all these inputs and cook them in a nice way to end up with minimal energy costs and win possibly quantum energy advantages. Okay? So, well, oops, yeah, so basically these are the first questions that the Quantum Energy Initiative uh, can, well, can tackle, but I'll put question, uh, I'll put suspension marks here because basically there is as many questions as individuals that will join the crowd. Um, possible questions are, is there a quantum energy advantage? Uh, when quantum processors scale up. And how different this quantum energy advantage is different from the uh, quantum computing advantage? That could be a first question. What is the fundamental minimal energy cost of quantum computing, taking into account the chain of control, as I was saying? How to avoid the energetic dead ends when we start to build a large-scale quantum computer? Um, and one question that is especially important, what is the, the relation between the resource cost at the quantum level, the one that people from quantum thermodynamics and quantum control, they are trying to uh, derive, and the resource cost at the macroscopic level? Is there some sort of amplification that justifies all the efforts that are done like in the basement? You see? This is an extremely important question to motivate uh, fundamental research beyond its fundamental research, okay? What are the missions of the QEI? The missions are, well, firstly, to create this transversal, cross-disciplinary, fundamental research slash industry research line, and create optimization methodologies, framework for quantum technologies and, and, and the, 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 the rest, um, propose energy-based benchmarks, and figures of merits and standards. And obviously here, because we have to start from somewhere, I'm talking about quantum computing, but the idea is to extend this to the other quantum technologies. Quantum sensing, quantum communication, uh, quantum neural networks. You see, we can replicate the game everywhere because there are always performances and resource costs. So we can, we can apply the same idea. Okay, and the first actions, so uh, we have a website uh, that was launched in August. We have a manifesto that, uh, if I was convincing, you are just welcome to, to, to sign up for. We have a poll, which is uh, less political than the manifesto, but also a way to manifest your interest in the initiative and be registered in the mailing list when we start making uh, taking actions and basically uh, here I'm, I'm, I'm mentioning some uh, the quantum energetics hub that we are about to create in Singapore so with uh, Dario and, and Nelly uh, I mean 
the friends of the quantum thermodynamics community and all good wills are most welcome to join. And the idea is to have a regular quantum energetic seminar, organize the first quantum energy initiative uh, uh, workshop at four, etc. So uh, I think I'm done with the advertisement. Uh, no, there are the first partners, sorry. <laughs> So yeah, there are startups that uh, answered. Uh, there are some research uh, research uh, institutions, and I'm extremely happy to have. Uh, well, how does it come? I'm Majulab and CQT, <laughs> and they are on, on the partners. Well, um, and what I want to say before I come to uh, science and scientific results is. Uh, it's non-binding when you are at the institutional level and you join as a partner. It's just saying that you agree with the values that are carry, uh, carried by the QEI, that you want to participate to a worldwide quantum energetic community and uh, participate to roadmaps and the like. And uh, you really work for sustainability and not for greenwashing, which is a, a wrong uh, idea that people com could get from this initiative. The idea is really here that Everything we want to do, it's sitting on the serious uh, academic knowledge. Uh, I mean, we are going to play the game as academics. Okay, so that's, I mean, something uh, we can think um, is a guarantee of being serious. Uh, right. So now I want to come to the, the second part of the talk, which is the proof of concept. Now that I properly sold why it's important and, and, and why it's challenging, I want to show you that actually it is possible to develop a methodology that bridges the gap between different communities and that we can apply it to start getting some, at least some behaviors. I'm not saying like uh, really figures and we are really providing an answer, no, stop the quantum computer because it will cost too much. That's not the, the, the point, but we can have some behaviors and some hope, maybe, for the optimistics. So um, this is the game I, I played with, uh, with my collaborators here. So uh, Robert Whitney, uh, who is in Grenoble, Wekun, that everyone knows, uh, my former PhD student, uh, Marco, Felu Saziani, Jing Hao, that did the PhD with Wekun, who was postdoc with me uh, at some moment, and Ivan Tonar, who is a researcher at, at CEA uh, in Grenoble. And so, um, and the, the, the paper I'm going to present, it's, it's on the archive if you get curious about the methodology that we have applied. So this methodology, what it is? In our jargon, we dubbed it MNR, like metric, noise, resource. And because they are the main actors, basically. So here you have your noisy computer. And uh, this noisy computer, it is going to give you some result with a certain metric of performance. That's the M of MNR. And this metric of performance, actually, it can be whatever you choose, but you have to choose. It can be a fidelity. It can be the size of the key you are going to break. It can be the Q score, if you are someone that works at Atos, you see? So it's one metric of performance. And uh, to uh, reach this metric of performance, because of the fact that the computer is noisy, you are going to spend some resource, okay, that's the R of MNR. And now, what do you have to do to minimize your resource cost? Well, the first thing that you have to do is to choose, as, as if you were an experimentalist, actually, you are going to uh, list all the control parameters that you have at your disposal to do your optimization can be the temperature of the processor, can be the number of physical qubits, can be the conduction of the wires. I'm, I'm really telling you, we are digging into something very engineering here. These are the typical, I mean, uh, figures, well, parameters you can, you can pretend you're going to play with. Um, and then you, as I was saying, you choose your metric of performance. Second, you go at the quantum level and you ask your favorite uh, uh, quantum open uh, physics, quantum open physics, um, physicist or expert, and you ask him what is the, the processor dynamics. And since it is a noisy quantum processor, this you, you end up with a well, 
typically a Lindblad equation or something, an equation that describes the dynamics of your processor, which depends on your control parameters. And I'm adding that in your control parameters, that can be the geometry of, your, of the quantum circuit you are going to play with in the CI. And obviously here, the processor dynamics will depend on the shape of the circuit. Okay, so that can be also a control parameter. And from this equation, you integrate over the time of the computation and you end up with, in principle, an expression that relates the metrics to the value of your control parameter. Okay? That's all very high level description here. Um, and then you repeat this game for the resource cost. So you list all the resources that you spend to do your computation. And obviously, your resource cost will depend on your control parameters, because they are the, par they are the parameters that capture all the physical situation. Okay? And this resource cost, so obviously in this talk, I'm going to tell you about power and energy. But that can be any resource, actually. The methodology can be transposed to any kind of resource like the time, or even the money, well. So it, it's very general approach. So that's the first step, which is already a huge work, by the way. Second step, if you want to optimize, you set up a, tar a target metric. So then the expression that you get for the metric of performance as a function of the parameter, you say, I want to reach M0 as a performance. This gives you an implicit relation on your control parameters. Second, you have your resource cost, and you just minimize it under this constraint. And you get doing so, well, so all the story, all I want to say here, it's a minimization under constraint that we are going to do. And uh, doing so, you maximize the resource efficiency, because you minimize the denominator. Okay, well, it's getting late, so I'm, I'm, I'm precising the steps. So that's basically this game we have played. And uh, we have played it um, on three types of quantum computation. The smallest one, which is the single qubit gate. Uh, we have played with a NISC circuit, and we have played with a fault-tolerant quantum computer. Uh, for the time that we have here, I'm just going to present you the first step and the last step. And if you have questions or, well, I'm based in security now, huh? so we can also discuss uh, here. I'm just, uh, like I was saying, it's, it's an advertisement stop spot. So let's go for the single qubit gate. Um, first of all, we have not treated the case of any single qubit gate. We have taken a case, uh, well, that I like a lot. <laughs> It's a resonant single qubit gate, so with a qubit that you attack uh, with a resonant pulse of light. So everything is described in the context of, a, of waveguide QED. Um, and uh, actually, this can implement any single qubit gate if you play with the shape of the pulse, with the phase of the pulse, or the detuning of the pulse. You can implement X, Y, Z, uh, whatever. So. What is MNR on such a, a component? Well, the noise we have considered is simply the spontaneous emission. The metric that we have considered, it's the gate fidelity. And if you compute it, uh, it won't come as a surprise that it can be written like this, where actually this is basically the number of spontaneous emission while you are trying to drive the qubit. So this is basically the number of errors during uh, the gate while you implement the gate. And the resource that we took, it's the typical power uh, so that the pulse inverts the qubit population. So you see it's very brute force approach here. Uh, we have not played the game of, oh, but uh, is that heat or is that work? Or uh, no, you're wrong, uh, well, uh, <laughs> etc. Because we are starting. And uh, uh, obviously, these are fields of research that is open. So we took very simple approach. And as a resource, it's the, end, the, the power for the pipers, basically. Now, uh, and, and uh, in the case of a waveguide QED, uh, the power of the pi pulse is a very simple expression uh, depending on gamma, the spontaneous emission rate, and the duration of the gate. It's analytically uh, computable. Now, uh, 
the control parameter that we choose here, because we are at the quantum level, so it's really the bare gate that we are addressing, it's the gate duration, tau. And actually here, it's very simple. If I target a given metric of performance, M0, then you see that it just sets the duration of the gate. And now I can compute the bare gate efficiency by dividing uh, the, the, the metric of performance, the fidelity, by the pi pulse power. And you arrive to an expression like this, which uh, it is what it is. I just want to insist on two, uh, on two points. First, what you can see here is that at the denominator, you have something that is I could say a signature of the qubit, because the h bar omega naught is the energy of the transition, the gamma is the energy of the, of the, well, the spontaneous emission rate. So it characterizes the qubit and how it decoheres. So actually, this bare gate efficiency, it can be used as a figure of merit to benchmark different qubit technologies. The, well, Obviously, the, the, the more decoherent, the, the smaller the, 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 the efficiency, okay? But we can decline that game playing with different qubits technologies. Another point which is a bit less uh, expected or intuitive is what happens if you try to increase your metric of performance. And as you can see here, uh, as soon as you reach values that get nearer and nearer one, which is the maximal uh, metric of performance you can target, then you see that the efficiency will become smaller and smaller. And it tells you that it become, it's becoming more and more expensive to gain one digit of uh, performance, okay? Which is an interesting behavior we found, and that actually we have recovered uh, for all the types of quantum computation we have studied after that. So at the level of NISC and at the level of the quantum uh, full tolerant quantum computation. Okay, so that's for the bare quantum level. And now, uh, and now comes uh, the interdisciplinary, uh, interdisciplinarity, okay? Because now we have to dress the gate. Because that's that um, at the macroscopic level where we are going to we, we are going to find the, the biggest resource cost. So we start from this, which is the bare single qubit gate, which, as I was saying in the introduction, does not exist by itself. So what we have to do, so as it exists, is to put the qubit in a box, and the qubit is actually at a cold temperature, TQ. And uh, it's get, it is isolated by the box, which, let's call it by its name, it's a cryostat. It's isolated uh, from the uh, room temperature environment. But once you have this, well, you are stuck because you cannot control your qubit. So then you have to make a hole in the box to inject the signal. But then the problem is that if there is a hole in the box, then you also inject noise. So what do people from superconducting circuits do? And if I'm saying crap, then Yvonne can correct me. Um, they are going to uh, actually prepare highly energetic signals here, big pulses, that they are going to attenuate on the way, uh, on the way to the qubit inside the cryostat. So that way, we can really improve the signal over noise ratio. But the price to pay is that first you have to prepare a highly energetic signal, and, and also it, it dissipates like hell inside the cryostat. Actually, it typically dissipates as much as you prepare. And this is the big cost, because you have to evacuate the heat that is dissipated. And even, well, even if you have a Carnot efficiency, this costs a lot. And actually, what I put in red here, it's the cryo power. So the power that you have to spend to evacuate the heat that is dissipated in the cryostat while you drive the gate. And actually, I put this in red because it answers some of the questions I raised during the introduction, which is, but is there an amplification factor between the resource cost at the microscopic level and at the macroscopic level? This is an example of where you see this amplification. So yes, if you are a quantum thermodynamician and you optimize the resource cost, it matters. I mean, maybe I'm going fast in, in, in work, but actually that's an important message 
uh, here that, uh, that I want to, to underline. There is a magnification factor of fundamental cost that corresponds to the macroscopic resource cost, which here is the cryo power. OK, so we then have made plots because we are physicists and physicists make plots. So what is plotted here, I'm going fast. Uh, we have uh, optimized, um, or first we have computed actually the Carnot power as a function of two optimization parameters that are the attenuation of the pulse and the temperature of the qubit. Here you see the lines here that correspond to the ISO metric of performance. And then the game is simply to find the minimum of this ISO metric of performance. And here you find your minimum resource cost. And from this minimal resource cost, well, you see that the bigger the metric of performance, uh, the bigger the resource cost. You can plot this kind of uh, efficiencies here. Well, so uh, with the behavior that I mentioned before, that's actually when you want to increase the efficiency, no, when you want to increase the metric of performance, you lose in efficiency. Okay? So just to show you that there is an interesting game to play already at the level of single, uh, single elements, uh, single devices. Okay, and um, another important message is that this, I hope uh, that it stimulates questions in your mind, and this is just the beginning, because we have played with idealized superconducting qubits, but what about other gates? What about two qubit gates? What about photonic gates when you send single photons on a beam splitter? What about ion-based gates? What about silicon spin qubit gate based? Whatever. So there are actually all the technologies of gates that you can investigate with this very simple approach. Um, and also here, I picked a single qubit gate, but there are all the primitive operations that are in the quantum computation that you can envision to start uh, model and optimize. Typically, the measurements, the preparation of state, and the, well, the gates, etc. Also, at this level, we just played with a very basic kind of noise, which is the thermal noise. But we, are, we all know that in a cryostat, this is not the thermal noise that is a problem. That is the pure dephasing. Uh, that uh, many other types of noise that pose problem before the thermal noise. So we need to extend our concepts and methodology to these uh, other types of noise. And obviously here, um, I took a very simple approach for the resource cost, which was the power of the pipes. But maybe all the conceptual, deep conceptual work that is done in quantum thermodynamics right now that is understanding the splitting between we heat and work can be extremely useful to understand the true resource cost at this level. So uh, there is clearly something to do here. And that's only for the quantum level. At the full stack level, what is very interesting, in my opinion, is to think about the dressing of the qubit by other technologies. Here, I have dressed a superconducting qubit with its cryostat and with its control electronics. But how would I dress photonic qubits? How would I dress ion-based qubits? And what is the impact on the efficiency of the gates? So all these questions, they are open. And uh, yeah, that's a bit of advertisement for uh, my uh, colleagues uh, and friends. So in, uh, in France, so Benjamin Huard, uh, with whom we studied the energetics of a single qubit gate, and uh, Pascal Senelard, with whom we are studying like heat and work for uh, photonic, uh, well, in integrated photonics. And so, uh, Chairman, I'm, I spoke slowly. How much, uh, how much time before I, I just... Uh, 10 minutes? OK. So yeah, that's, that's the last part. And um, here again, I, I'm going to draw directions and open doors and, and, and leave questions everywhere. That's actually the, the spirit of this talk. So I'm going to show you what we did by applying this MNR methodology now to a very idealized model of super, uh, superconducting fault-tolerant quantum computer. OK? So uh, uh, and then I'm going first to throw you pinches of salt <laughs> with respect to what I'm going to tell you. Uh, because of what? Because of our goals. Actually, our goal is to explore the energy costs of a large-scale fault-tolerant quantum computer 
taking into account the full stack. So we, we really want to dress the processor with all the enabling technologies it, it, it requires, actually. And we want to explore, based on this modeling, the conditions of an energetic advantage. So we have started really to, to address this question as the processor scales up. Obviously, to explore the energetic quantum advantage, we need to pick up uh, a, a scalable quantum computer, right? We need to pick up, ideally, a, 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 a computer that uh, is able to work. <laughs> so that's why uh, we have been um, compelled to pick up very idealized values for the superconducting qubits. So we have neglected the pure dephasing noise, and we took like values for the uh, T1 that like uh, explode the values of Sycamore. Uh, it's uh, 100 times better, so just to tell you uh, that I'm going to show a quantum energy advantage, but again, take it with a pinch of salt. It doesn't mean tomorrow uh, Google will publish a, a quantum energy advantage. Just, uh, well, it's possible on the paper. And um, something else that we did, which probably will make experimenters laugh, is that we, we picked a code which is absolutely not popular. It's the concatenated seven qubit code. No one talks about this code anymore. <laughs> Uh, people, they do surface code, they do like uh, uh, topologic codes, uh, they do uh, uh, whatever cat code, they don't do seven qubit code. But as theorists, it's a nice code because it's all analytic, it's perfectly well known, it's perfectly masterized and textbook, and we don't neglect any uh, energy cost, nothing is hidden, basically. So we are really doing something that we control, okay? So that's the philosophy. Um, and knowing that, well, this is that we did. So we, especially Marco, uh, who was not afraid of learning fault tolerance with Wekun and uh, cryogeny with Air Liquid, uh, he modeled all this, so the full stack quantum computer. The control parameters that we took uh, was the attenuations on the line, so one wire pi per physical qubit, the temperature of the processor, the temperature of the signal generation, the level of error correction for the steam code, and our resource cost uh, was the, well, is the cryo power plus the control electronic. We really took the uh, classical information processing dissipation into account to uh, end up with something sensible. And then the noise that we have considered at the quantum level, this is the thermal noise. And like I said, well, you uh, unfold the MNR methodology, so you model the fault-tolerant quantum processor as a quantum open system, and you target a specific metric of performance, which in this case is we want the computation to uh, be successful with a probability of two-thirds. So we, we have to taken this metric of performance. And uh, we did this, and actually um, what we did was to pick up a very generic circuit. So we have considered like a, a rectangular circuit with QL logical qubits that uh, keep quantum information during DL uh, steps, logical steps. So it's a quantum memory, basically. And, uh, and this, with this probability of success of two thirds, gives us an implicit relation on the control parameters. And with this implicit relation, we have a constraint under which we minimize uh, the uh, power, the resource cost. And uh, the 2D map that you see here is the result of this minimization with the number of logical qubits in the x-axis and, and the logical depth on the y-axis. And here, the color lines that you see correspond to the change of concatenation level. The bigger the circuit or the, the, the more deep, the deeper your circuit, the more uh, concatenation you need, and therefore the, more, the bigger power you need to, to, to realize your computation. Um, so this uh, actually is very cool, um, and we have used it to actually try to get an idea of the power consumption for what people say useful quantum algorithms, so typically the, the short one. And uh, actually what we did was to estimate, to use this model, to estimate the power consumption to break uh, RSA on an N-size 
uh, key. Uh, following the prescription of uh, Gidney and, and Ikera, that gives us, for the size of the key we want to break, the number of logical qubits that are needed and the depth of the circuit. Okay, So we say we want to break a key of size n, it gives us the QL, the DL, and then we extract uh, the, power, the minimal power consumption from our 2D map. So that's what we did. And with this, actually, we have started to explore this idea of quantum energy advantage. So we've picked different size of key. So one possible size is uh, 829, yes, which actually can be broken by a classical supercomputer. This was an experiment that was done by, uh, also in France, actually, by, by INRIA, where they actually measured this uh, consumption, this energy consumption for their uh, supercomputer, which corresponds to 1.3 megawatts in 8.6 days, and uh, using our model, we have computed that a quantum computer with these top quality qubits and STEAM code would only need 2.7 uh, gigajoule. Again, to be taken with a pinch of salt, there are excellent qubits, uh, excellent information processing, blah, 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 but still it gives you an idea of how we can tackle and explore the problem. The second thing that we did is to look at uh, the quantum energy supremacy. And uh, here we picked the key of size uh, 2048. Obviously, for a classical computer, it's too much because we are in the regime of quantum computational supremacy. But with the quantum computer, what we can hope is that it's only 7 megawatts in 1.5 hours. Okay? So, what's the take home message of all this? It's that uh, with all the precautions that I took, I'm saying that we have a methodology that allows us to explore if there is some potential for a quantum energy advantage. And while the quantum computer is being built, optimize its energy consumption all along the way. So in some sort of adiabatic uh, approach. Okay, And uh, obviously, Again, this is just the beginning. It needs to be consolidated on more realistic qubits, on more realistic architectures, and uh, taking into account this full stack energy costs in a coordinated way. And uh, one last question I want to address before I, I conclude. It's um, this difference between the quantum energy advantage and the usual quantum computational advantage. Because when you try to convince decision makers that it's important to fund uh, energetic approaches, etc. they will say, well, but you know, uh, uh, if your computer, it goes faster, then obviously it will consume less energy. So I'm already funding you somehow. So go, <laughs> go and play, okay? And uh, actually, um, what I want to insist on is that it's not the same to optimize energy consumption and to optimize the time of computation simply because time is not energy. Huh? We are physicists. Time is not energy. There is the power in between. So that It's proportionality. Okay. So what we did is going a little bit more, well, a little bit further than, than this, and really explore energetic versus computational advantage. And to do so, we have actually computed the time of computation uh, as a function of the size of the key, for the classical computer and for different kinds of quantum processors that differ with the energy consumption of uh, the control electronics or, uh, or the decoherence of the qubits. Okay? So we have actually this that basically tells you that after some time, the classical computer will need more time to compute than the quantum computer. So that's these regions here, they define the quantum computational advantage as we expect. Okay? And now, uh, the idea is to look at the quantum energy advantage. So this is the energy efficiency that is defined, uh, that is defined as uh, the key size divided by the energy consumption, again for the classical computer, and for these different kind of quantum computers here. And what you can see here, I'm not commenting on the colors because I'm, I'm running out of time and, and of brain, actually, um, but there is an explanation. Um, what you can see here, what I want to insist on, is that if you pick up the green line, which is the one that corresponds to the most coherent qubits 
with the best or the most efficient classical information processing, the quantum energy advantage is reached before the quantum computational advantage. Take home message being, there are some regimes where a quantum computer will take more time to compute, but will consume less energy. So first of all, these are different regimes. And then it's not the same to optimize to get one or the other. And then if we are, I mean, um, yeah, then I will, I will stop here. Uh, one may save energy before time. And actually, this can be extremely important for people of the, of the NISC community, because in the NISC community, what you can observe is that the quantum computational advantage has not been probed yet. But if one can find a quantum energetic advantage, that can be extremely good for this community. OK, and that was the, 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 the last bit of science. Uh, these are the concluding remarks, which actually I will skip because I think I was like heavy on some take home messages. So normally you already have them in mind. And I want to uh, uh, thank, uh, well, thank the group uh, that uh, I left in Grenoble, uh, but some of them are already here. So uh, Maria, Samiak, and, and Nicolo, they are spending one month in Singapore. And uh, this is the list of topics investigated. And I'm starting here, so applications are really most welcome. Thank you very much.